because today's webinar is on data cleaning, pre-processing, and machine learning practices. And it is with great honor that I would like to introduce our speaker for today's session, Dr. Amal Shehan Pereira. Dr. Amal Shehan Pereira is a senior lecturer of computer science at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Moratua. He is a co-owner of a US patent for his multiple research publications. His achievements include winning the ACM KDD Cup in 2006 for data mining, and he was invited to work as a senior visiting research scholar at the North Dakota State University in 2009. Thank you, Dr. Amal, for taking time off your busy schedule to be with us today. I'm pretty sure our audience is looking forward to a very interesting session. So without further ado, I will now hand over the controls to you, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and uh, inviting me to uh, uh, do a presentation on uh, a related area to what you will be doing in this uh, data science challenge uh, that you are taking part in. But yeah, let me uh, uh, get started with uh, uh, yeah, I need you. Yeah. yeah, just to give a few seconds when, until we get the Okay, we're ready to go. Right, so uh, this session uh, I have titled uh, Data Science uh, Intro to Data Preprocessing. That is what was requested by the organizers. Uh, and I normally use this uh, picture whenever I talk about data science because uh, the int more, I mean, the objective of uh, doing data science for us is uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we take decisions based on uh, data and the analytics that we do rather than taking decisions based on uh, whoever who thinks is the powerful person or whoever who thinks is the most paid person in a in a discussion or a decision taking uh, environment right so that's uh, why i have this picture and uh, hippo is actually the highest paid person uh, officer right so we don't want uh, that to happen we want uh, data driven decision making to be done Right, so when we do data uh, science or when we try to do data driven decision making, uh, the most exciting part is to do the analytics or to maybe to use machine learning algorithms. But there is uh, another very important part in uh, data science that is uh, the data preprocessing. Sometimes we spend about 60 to 70 percent of our time of a, in a project doing data preprocessing because it's very, very important if you don't get the data right. Uh, whatever we do after that will uh, or may not work the way we want it. Uh, this is also another slide that I always, uh, actually this was uh, created last year for the data storm, uh, where I was asked to talk about uh, uh, the skills that are required for data science. So before I go to data proposing, a, a little bit of introduction, right? So definitely from an education point of view, we need to make sure that uh, we have the mathematics, statistics, the computer science and engineering and the information technology background. From a technical point of view, we need to make sure that we have the programming, a little bit about database systems, machine learning, uh, maybe uh, uh, how to use scalable computing when it comes to big data and visualization. And not only that, sometimes uh, it's very important to have some idea about the business or the domain in which we are going to apply. Now, I don't want you to, I mean, this is uh, this whole, competition or this show activity is done as part of introducing data science. So I don't want you to get uh, uh, get discouraged to the thinking that I uh, maybe we don't have all these skills, but uh, don't worry, just just to make, make it clear, right? What is required, but it doesn't mean that uh, you need to have all of them uh, together at the same time to succeed. And, and, uh, and uh, from, uh, from a soft skills point of view, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have communication skills, 
being able to work in, coll uh, in, in collaboratively with others because uh, uh, none of the projects uh, we will be able to do on our own. We'll have to use, uh, get, uh, get into a team and do. And also it's very, very important that we, uh, we, uh, we have the skill of the learning or what we call lifelong uh, learning because well, most of the things that you would be doing, what you'll be trying out, uh, would be you will be doing it for the first time, right? And you may have not done it or used it earlier, right? So you have to learn, you have to figure out what to do, and uh, right. So that's a very important skill that we need to have. That is required in any area, but when it comes to data science, it's very very important. And also, I have added perseverance because uh, sometimes it doesn't work the first time. You need to try, keep trying and trying and trying. It's very important. And storytelling is also another very important thing. Once you have, I think, uh, in this competition also, there is uh, 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 pitching, right? You need to do a pitch, right? So how do you build a story from the data that you have? Right? So that's uh, another very important skill that you should have. And also data science, uh, in the introductory video also you saw these areas that are coming together the mathematics and statistics computer science and uh, the, the domain that is coming together to create data science i mean we are not saying it it's being uh, indicated by the uh, acm which is the association for computing machinery the curriculum that has been created for data science so uh, these are the areas key areas that uh, come together to uh, uh, make data science right so before once again before we go to data uh, introduction to uh, reprocessing. Uh, what can we do with data science? Just as an introduction, right? So something that you know. Uh, I mean, any area that you take out there, we will be using. Uh, we are using data science, right? So, for example, social networking. Facebook is using data science. Uh, E-commerce applications. Amazon and other areas are using uh, data science uh, to take. Uh, Taxi hailing, uh, like Uber is the biggest uh, global company, but we can take our own pick me. Uh, it is also using uh, data science. And then uh, banking, we see a lot of uh, areas, uh, I mean, a lot of banking applications. And when, when it comes to banking, uh, data science is being used heavily. Airbnb is a kind of a, uh, what you call, accommodation uh, providing application right so uh, kind of a uh, loose way of uh, providing accommodation that is also using spotify i think you already are familiar with right so i can go on and on and on where data science is being used in these are some of the major applications that we are using let's get to uh, a very close example in sri lanka right so these are projects that we have done right so for example uh, if you talk about dengue right so these days dengue is uh, spreading very rapidly at the moment right so uh, so what can we do, right? So something that we could do is to try to see whether we could uh, use some data-driven decision making to actually uh, decide on uh, uh, where we should target on um, now something that we all know is that uh, dengue is spread by uh, mosquitoes and uh, uh, mosquitoes cannot travel um, uh, large distances therefore it's actually in an area when once an area gets started in, in to get infected we see that it is spreading uh, in that area right so is there a way for us to actually forecast and say okay next week or in two weeks time this is these are the red areas that are going to have dengue right so if we can do that we can take a decision and try to clean those areas or try to take action or warn the people that you should be careful Right, rather than warning everybody to be careful or rather than trying to clean the entire country. Right? So that's an example of what we can do with data science. Uh, I mean, I'm giving an example very, very close to our home, right? Yeah, so once again, I think I already elaborated on this uh, uh, convolution of uh, the different areas that come together in data science, right? Uh, before we go to data preprocessing, a little bit about the machine learning pipeline that we have. Right, so I'm going to talk about the data science pipeline also, right? Before that, uh, let's look at uh, the exciting part. Typically in data science, we use uh, machine learning to learn about the data and then maybe build a model and then maybe do some forecasting. Now, for example, the example that I gave you earlier, the dengue case, uh, we have the data, we put that data into a, a machine learning pipeline and then uh, we build a model. And from that model, we are able to, uh, we are able to uh, come up with a forecast for the maybe the next two weeks uh, depending on how good our data is and how good our model is 
Right, so typically in an application like this, or typically in a project like this, we will get some training data. Right? Training data is actually captured from the domain where we are, uh, we are trying to apply this uh, model, right? And then we will have, we need to do a bit of data engineering and machine learning, right? So, uh, right, so first of all, we need to study the problem, right? Once we study the problem, we, we can uh, get an idea about uh, the type of training data that we need. Uh, in most cases, we might be able to figure out, uh, uh, in most cases, we are restricted to the available data set, right? We may not be able to go out and uh, find new data sets, right? But uh, we may have to stick to the data that is given, right? Right? Yeah, so once we uh, have the training data, once we have studied the problem, what we could do is we could come up with a machine learning model that, that can capture the essence of this uh, training data that we have, right? So now, is that enough? We need to make sure that we test it also, right? So typically what we do is we break the training data set into another part or test da uh, data that is actually independent of the, uh, the part that we use for training and we evaluate the model, right? And uh, obviously when we build a model initially, there will be errors. It will not be predicting the way that we want, not at the 100% that we want or the 90% that we want, right? So with errors, so we'll get some feedback uh, from the model, right? Based on that, we can try to fix the uh, data engineering pipeline or the uh, data science pipeline or the machine learning uh, uh, parts that the model that we are using or else sometimes we might have to, maybe that we have not, not properly understood the problem. We might have to go back to the problem and study the problem and check and see whether we, uh, we have done it. Once we go through multiple iterations, what we can do is we could uh, actually use this model for decision making, right? So once it is at an acceptable level of quality, we can use it for decision making, right? So that's the machine learning pipeline, right? So if you look at the, data science pipeline, right? So machine learning, very, very similar, right? But uh, in this, we have uh, data acquisition, uh, data processing, data integration, data uh, kind of uh, building uh, models and analytical models. And then there's a validation uh, step and then there's a presentation. Right? And also I have these uh, arrows coming back uh, from each one of these uh, steps. Why is that? I, I think I alluded to that in the previous uh, uh, set, uh, set slide also why we are doing that is that uh, most of the time we can't do a perfect job it's not a one it's not one way traffic right it's uh, we might have to come back we might have to come back to the previous step or sometimes you might have to come back to the uh, starting point right so it's a iterative uh, process that you need to do in the uh, data science pipeline and data reprocessing right just before we do the data analytics data pre reprocessing is one of the key things, uh, as I told you earlier, that sometimes we spend about 60 to 70% of our time on data pre-processing. So, so that's why we are going to talk about data pre-processing. Once again, uh, I would like you to, uh, like to give a warning. I'm not here to give you some, uh, uh, show you some libraries and say, okay, this is how you should be, uh, this is how you can uh, use uh, uh, this library to uh, do some cleaning or do, do some fixing. Right. I'm, I'm actually going to use uh, these slides uh, from actually one of the textbooks uh, that is uh, quite well written and which has a significant component on uh, uh, data pre-processing. Actually, one chapter is on data pre-processing. And if you guys uh, uh, really want uh, and send me an email, I might be able to send you that chapter only, not the whole book, because otherwise I would be violating uh, 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 understanding that from for which I have got the book. Right? So therefore I know this author, the main author is uh, quite uh, quite nice guy. Right? So yeah, so we can, uh, I can do that. But uh, remember, uh, as I said, I'm going to actually uh, cover some of the theoretical background so that you know uh, what are the different areas that you can try and how they affect, well, how they affect uh, the data science process. Yeah, so guys, if you have any questions, uh, you can stop me. 
I also have a, a chat window open on my second screen. So because the power came back, uh, I can have a, have a look at it on my side of my eye. And so therefore, let me know if you have a question or it's not uh, clear. And once again, so the, the slide has uh, slides have a lot of content. That doesn't mean that I'm going to uh, read out all the content in the slides. I'm going to give you a kind of an overview going through this uh, content so that we cover almost everything that, that is part of uh, uh, data preprocessing so that you have an idea. Uh, you can use tools uh, that are out there, or you can use a library. Um, Python libraries are there. Quite a lot of extensive Python libraries there are there for you to use, but very, very important not to just use the tool or not to just uh, use the library. It's very important to know what is happening so that you know exactly how to use those uh, uh, libraries with some. And also, you might be able to explain sometimes the outcome, right? So it's always impo important that you understand what well, I said, it's an iterative process, right? So you have to come back, right? To, to come back and do what? Do What do we do? We need to understand what is happening, right? So to understand what is happening, you should know what you have done to the data, right? So to know what you have done to the data, you need to know some of these uh, techniques and how they work, right? So once again, we can't go too much into depth, but I'll try to go to uh, or go through all the areas uh, very, very briefly. So I would cover, I'll give you a basic overview of uh, data preprocessing and what is important when it comes to why it is important with respect to data quality. And then we'll talk about some of the major tasks in uh, data preprocessing, right? Uh, uh, we'll talk about the data cleaning, data integration, data reduction, data transformation, and uh, data discretization. And uh, finally, we'll have some uh, uh, kind of summary, right? So very, very briefly, uh, data quality is very important. As I told you, that is the reason why we have, uh, we spend 60 to 70% of our time on uh, on uh, data pre-processing, <clears throat> right? So when it comes to data quality, accuracy is very important, right? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, whether, whether whatever the data that we have, is it correct or is it wrong, right? Is it accurate, right? Um, Consistency, what we mean by consistency, if uh, something is some value here uh, uh, in another place also, it should be the same, right? Otherwise, it's going to be uh, inconsistent data. But timeliness uh, is, I mean, also considered as uh, data quality uh, because uh, we need to have the data on time, right? So otherwise, uh, I mean, what is the point of having some data maybe after one year, right? So for example, if, you, if I take the example of uh, the dengue case, uh, forecasting, we need to have the current data to do the forecasting properly. Otherwise, uh, we, we have uh, three years of data that is uh, 10 years old. Uh, that is not high quality data for the purpose of what we are trying to do, right? Um, uh, yeah, timeliness, uh, then believability, right? So uh, uh, is this, uh, it's a little bit similar to interpretability also, right? Um, uh, is this the data trustworthy, right? And interpretability is when you look at the data, you should be able to say, okay, this is why the data is like this. This is why the data is like that. Or if you do a small analysis or if you do a descriptive analysis, you should be able to explain what uh, what is going on in the data, right? So that would be also an important aspect of uh, data quality. And so, and uh, to improve the data quality, uh, some of the things that we can do as part of data processing is, one is data cleaning, data integration, data reduction, right? Uh, the, I will take each one of them. So that's why I'm uh, going on it to very, very briefly. And, the, and data transformation, right? So uh, transforming the data into a, a, a form that would help us to do the analytics or that would help us to do the, uh, the, uh, uh, the data, uh, I mean, data mining or the data science or the machine learning, the modeling that we want to do. Right, so uh, this slide actually shows you the areas that I described earlier in a pictorial form, right? Data cleaning, data cleaning is uh, cleaning the data, data integration is combining the data, data transformation is com com converting the data into some other form uh, that is more useful, easy to understand, easy to process, right? And data uh, reduction is uh, a kind of, uh, uh, the data is in a larger format, but we want to put it into a smaller format, right? So that is uh, what we mean by data reduction. Right, so let's take uh, data cleaning, right? So why do we need uh, data cleaning, right? So sometimes we have incomplete data, right? So uh, maybe when we were entering the data, it was not properly entered, right? So therefore it's in incomplete, or at the time that was entered, that information was not available. So somebody did not enter it. That's one part of it. Uh, another part of it is noisy data. What is noise now? 
I don't know. I think you are not hearing any any noise coming from my audio, right? Uh, because there's some nice background cancellation on Zoom, right? So noise means things that we don't want, right? So uh, in data also there are certain things that we don't want, right? For example, salary salary should be something between uh, 100,000 to 200,000 or maybe 400,000 in the case of computer science uh, people, right? So uh, it should not be uh, uh, minus 10, right? So if that is minus 10, that's obviously noise, right? And then uh, there could be inconsistencies, right? So uh, uh, for example, one place the data is saying age is 42 and in another place we have a birthday also, right? So a uh, birthday, when we translate the birthday to the current date, the age is wrong. Or it's not consistent, right? So that can be there. Or it could be that uh, earlier we collected the data as uh, ratings of one, two, three. Now we are collecting the data. Later we are collecting the ratings as ABC. Some people have put it at one, two, three. Some people have entered the data at ABC or the way we captured the data, there is some inconsistency. Uh, there could also be intentional uh, uh, things, right? Uh, intentional uh, issues. Uh, uh, that we have tried to, uh, I, mean, I mean, and creating missing data in the in the data set, right? So those are uh, areas why we need to do data cleaning. Let's very very briefly look at uh, how we can do the uh, data cleaning, right? Uh, right. So data is not always uh, available, right? So and uh, there could be issues, right? Uh, therefore, we may have to uh, do the data cleaning. And why why do we come across uh, uh, data issues or uh, issues to uh, uh, of, uh, of missing data right so for example uh, equipment malfunction would be an issue, a situation where uh, uh, we have not collected right so sometimes it was collecting data sometimes it, it was not collecting data right uh, right uh, or maybe somebody had a misunderstanding when uh, they were entering the data right uh, and Maybe a certain time we considered some of the data to be important, but now we are considering it as not important, right? So we have uh, missed adding the data, right? And so that could be a lot of uh, uh, issues like this, uh, that where we end up getting uh, missing data. And so how, I mean, when you have missing data, missing data is easy to clean because we know that there is, uh, I mean, we can see that it is missing, right? Not like uh, noise, right? Missing data, we know that it's missing. And so what can we do? Right, so one thing that we could do is uh, maybe, uh, no, no, no. We can uh, actually try to drop uh, those uh, row of data or the, that column of data, right? So that's one way of doing it. Uh, but sometimes we may not be able to afford uh, dropping the column or the uh, dropping the row uh, because there's so much of missing data. Well, if you drop all those columns and all those data, we might end up having not enough data. Or else we can try to see whether you could manually look at that data point and try to fix it. But when you're talking about large data sets with millions of data items, we can't manually do that. And so what about other options, right? So one other option would be to maybe put a global constant, right? Uh, maybe say unknown class or unknown, uh, if it is a class label that is missing, we can, uh, that might be a little bit of an issue, but uh, or else we can put a, a global value, uh, maybe based on the domain, we decide, okay, this is the best value that we can put for the missing values and just uh, use it. Because in the case of a missing data item, uh, the rest of the uh, data is available, right? So the rest of the data, we can make use of it, but just because we are, we don't have a value here, we ca cannot use it, right? We don't want to throw it off, we want to use it, right? So we can put a global constant. Or else we can maybe take a attribute me, right? Uh, or else, uh, what we could do is rather than just taking the overall attribute mean, maybe we could uh, take the mean based on the class, right? Right. So, so if there are multiple classes, three or four classes, what we could do is, uh, per, I mean, earlier instance we were taking the mean for the entire attribute. Now we within the class, we so we if we know the class, what we do is uh, we put the mean for that class, right? So therefore there is some uh, separation also, or else we can even go much more sophisticated approach of uh, uh, maybe using some forecasting to forecast the missing value, right? So now the problem was to come up with a model to forecast uh, the class label. Now the training data has missing labels. We are actually trying to forecast the missing values, right? So I have this, uh, this is not from the textbook. Uh, I have this uh, slide that tries to explain uh, uh, these three approaches. Uh, so I think the first one is clear, right? So uh, uh, 
right so the glo lo global constant is clear right so what we are doing is uh, uh, we just decide whatever value that we want and uh, we put that value right and the second approach uh, we have is uh, just to put a mean right uh, uh, mean of the entire data set right so we we take the entire data set and uh, uh, we 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 uh, uh, we take the mean mean for the entire data set right uh, for the entire attribute right so uh, or else what we could do is uh, because these are coming from two two different uh, uh, i mean this data set has a a and b b right so this is coming from two data sets right so rather than uh, putting the uh, mean for the entire data sets why not we do take the mean for the uh, because we know the class is a right so therefore we take the mean of that right that's another uh, way of doing it or else uh, we can actually try to forecast right so uh, uh, later you will be talking about different machine learning approaches uh, uh, right so we can use some kind of a machine learning approach to try to uh, uh, predict this value uh, based on uh, based on the da uh, the data that we have in this example i'm only showing the class label and the original column right there might be other columns right so that those columns will support us in predicting this uh, unknown missing value right so that's a, a way of uh, uh, that's a way of uh, 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 doing it Okay, so uh, right, so this uh, uh, that is on uh, on uh, cleaning or uh, so so filling missing data. Right. Uh, when it comes to noisy data, uh, it's a bit hard because uh, first of all, we need to identify the noise. Right. So we, as I told you, sometimes uh, noise might be even useful for us. Right. So there are situations where sometimes we do what we call outlier analysis, where noise is what we are looking for as the outliers. Right. So in those scenarios, uh, 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 yeah. So in that case, in that case. Uh, 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 noise is a bit harder problem to solve than uh, just uh, filling the missing values. Right? But both these are part of uh, a data cleaning, right? So once again, why we would end, end up getting noise is uh, in the in the case of uh, missing data, it's that the device didn't function. Actually, if the device though is not functioning, that's good, <laughs> because if the device is functioning in a faulty manner. Where it's uh, where the reading should be 100 and we are getting a reading of 10, uh, that is a bigger problem, right? So, but anyway, we need to, uh, right? So, data entry problems, all those things could be uh, issues that uh, that are causing these problems, right? Uh, <clears throat> right. Uh, and uh, another problem is uh, 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 having duplicate records, right? Or as incomplete uh, data or inconsistent data, right? So, all those things. Uh, uh, could be issues that we have, right? So what can we do for this type of problem, right? So a few options are available. One is called uh, binning, right? I have a I have a separate slide for each one of them, right? So where we try to put it into different bins, and then uh, what would happen is even if there is a noise, because we are pushing them into different bins, this noise comes into a bin, right? Noisy noisy data point also comes into a bin, and then becomes uh, less noisy, right? So we can call it less noisy. Or else uh, regression can be used uh, where we try to fit the data into a regression uh, curve or line or whatever. And then we push all the data points that are quite not fitting into that uh, uh, into that uh, regression line. Or else we can try to do some clustering, right? Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with clustering. Clustering is also uh, another machine learning approach that we have called, uh, I mean, it's categorized as a unsupervised learning mechanism where we we we, are, we try to put the data that are there that is there into multiple groups right so if you can put them into groups uh, what we could do is the ones that are not fitting into the group can be put into that group right so nice points that are out there can be put into right and a lot of scenarios it's a case of uh, not just depending automated uh, mechanisms it's a case of combining automated mechanisms with human inspection, right? Human input is very important. Otherwise, uh, actually, uh, we would not be having a challenge like this. Otherwise, uh, uh, Octave would not be f sponsoring this, uh, right? If uh, human intervention was not required, right? We need human uh, yeah. human expertise, right? It's, if it can be done uh, like what we call robotic automation, 
but then we don't need the human intervention, right? So human in inspection, humans can actually analyze, look at it and uh, look at some visualization and maybe suggest certain uh, things that can be do, uh, done to uh, fix the noise. Right, so as I, as I told you, data cleaning is uh, much more straightforward. When it comes to noise, uh, we need a little bit more uh, effort, right? So binning, very, very briefly, binning is uh, uh, kind of, uh, now this example shows you some data points, right? Four, eight, nine, uh, whatever uh, data points. And then what we could do is, uh, uh, I mean, we can uh, bin it into different ways, like uh, equal frequency or um, uh, depth, right? Whatever, right? So, so what we will do is uh, uh, we will take uh, the values and put it into the three uh, three different bins. In, the, in this case, we have decided to put into three different bins. And then what we would be doing is uh, uh, we would be uh, uh, putting the values, right? So, for example, in the second example, I'm sp uh, showing smoothing by the bin mean. So rather than uh, putting the different values, now what we're doing is we are taking the mean of that bin and making all the values uh, the mean value, right? So if there is any noise value, they are now getting shifted to the mean, right? So therefore we, we, we can uh, reduce that uh, noise that, that is there in the data, right? Or else what we could do is uh, smoothing by bin boundaries. That's also possible, right? So we take the boundary values of these bins and whatever the value which is closer to the, the boundary, if it is the left-hand side boundary, we put that value. If it is the right-hand side boundary, we put the other value. Likewise, we do it, right? And in that case, uh, it's not the mean. There is some variation, but those variations are limited to the bin boundaries, right? So that's another way of doing it. There are multiple ways of doing it. Just I'm showing you some examples uh, to show you how we can reduce this or uh, remove the noise, right? Yeah, so regression is also another approach uh, where we can actually uh, use uh, I mean, try to avoid the noisy data points, right? So obviously, if there's a, a noisy data point somewhere here, what we could do is we could try to uh, push it to the uh, regression line and uh, uh, maybe, I mean, I'm only showing a, a linear regression, right? So, uh, and try to uh, fix the issue or try to uh, reduce the effect of the noise, right? So what we're trying to do is that, right? Once again, cluster analysis is also, I explained what cluster analysis is. Uh, when we have the data, what we could do is we could try to uh, put them into uh, different groups. And once we have these, uh, uh, once we have these, uh, uh, I mean, these noisy points, what we could do is one one thing with that we could do is we could even identify the noise points uh, uh, through the. By doing some clustering and then maybe uh, either try to push it to the closest cluster or something like that, or whatever we want to do uh, uh, can be done uh, by using cluster, clustering. Right? So once again, uh, the ob objective here is to uh, try to get these uh, noisy data points uh, into the uh, main data set that we have. Just give me one second. Uh, Right. So, uh, oh, we are running out of time. Hopefully, we have enough uh, time to cover everything. Right. So, I'll uh, maybe uh, browse uh, through this. Right. So, uh, definitely, um, the important thing that I want to mention here is that uh, when it comes to uh, uh, data reprocessing, and especially when it comes to uh, data cleaning, right. Uh, it's it's a very very important process, and then uh, uh, I mean uh, in the in the I mean maybe you have already heard about it this uh, ETL process extraction transformation and loading right so in those uh, when we are doing that we can actually make sure that uh, we look at uh, what's happening with the data and then maybe try to integrate some of these uh, cleaning noise removal paths into that uh, pipeline so that we can get it done. Right. Once again, uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, as all, although I said the, the whole uh, data uh, science pipeline is uh, iterative and interactive, the data cleaning itself is also iterative and interactive, right? So you do it multiple times, you look at it, you look at the uh, visualizations, and then you take decisions on what would be the best way to uh, do it. Right, so that's about data cleaning. Let's quickly go through uh, data integration. What is data integration? Once again, uh, multiple data sources can uh, uh, can be combined in uh, scenarios uh, when it comes to uh, 
uh, data science or machine learning activities. Right? So what we mean by data integration is combining these multiple sources, multiple formats into one source so that we can either put it into a data warehouse and do the analytics or maybe run our machine learning algorithms on top of this uh, data set that we have. Right? So um, uh, some of the issues that we come across when it come, when, when we uh, do data integration, right? So how do we do data integration? For example, uh, we might be having two data sets uh, coming uh, about customers, right? From two different sources, right? So in the, in, the, in the two data sources, if it is clearly indicated customer, customer, now I think the data set that you are going to get uh, for this challenge would be nice, uh, a nice data set where the, the um, the attributes will be uh, named and you might be able to clearly identify that these two, uh, this is the same attribute in two different uh, data sources so that we can use that uh, to combine the data, right? Uh, people who know a little bit of uh, uh, databases uh, would uh, recall that uh, we, we use what we call this join key to combine data sets together, data sources together, right? So we, we know what those attributes are, but there are situations where we don't know that. And then we might have to guess uh, what would be the uh, attribute that we should use to combine this data set, right? So I'm here I'm talking about not combining two, uh, I'm talking about combining two data sets, uh, independent data sets, but there is some connection through this uh, 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 attribute that is common to both, both these data sets, right? So in this example, uh, customer ID, customer ID, maybe one data set is saying customer ID, some one, another data set is saying customer, but we know that it's the, the thing that we should use to integrate, right? So we may have to use some of the metadata, meta information to know about the data sources to identify what uh, should be used. Even after doing that, sometimes we get into problems, right? So this is a good example. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, uh, because it's a book written in the US, uh, we are using an example from the US. And so sometimes uh, if you are using, if uh, ID is used, we don't have this problem, but sometimes if you are using a name, right, uh, to combine, I think I can, I can give a good example after this, I give you. Right, so maybe one data set, uh, it's saying Bill Clinton, the other uh, this data set, it's using William Clinton. In the US, actually, there's this uh, thing of using a short form of the name. For William, they use Bill, right? So uh, when you are integrating, we have to make sure that these two, I mean, this is the same person, right? So therefore, it should be integrated together, right? So those are issues that we can come across, right? I, I want to, although we are short of time, uh, I would like to tell you this example. Uh, a few years ago, we got this uh, request uh, from the examination uh, department uh, that conducts A-level, O-level, everybody, everything, uh, for us to integrate or uh, do some analytics on the, on the student performance of scholarship, O-level, A-level, and university entrance. Right, so when it comes to O-level, A-level, university entrance, uh, the student has an NIC. Right, so therefore we are able to combine it. But when it comes to scholarship, NIC is not there. Actually now people are, the, the government or the people are looking at giving an NIC number, uh, or, or the, not the NIC, but the number when you are born itself, right? So that uh, uh, we have something to identify. Right, so what can we do? We'll have to use the names, right? To combine the scholarship exam and the whole level, right? So, but when you use the names, uh, the names are typed in English, uh, the names are given in Singhala and Tamil, right? So therefore, sometimes the way we write in English might be slightly different. So it's a bit of a mess uh, trying to combine, right? So those are the challenges that uh, we have to face uh, when we do uh, uh, data integration, right? Uh, first of all, identifying the attribute to integrate. Next is uh, if there is some variation in the attribute. If it is not an ID, it is, if it is not a unique key, uh, we might be in trouble, right? Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we, we, we may have to do that. And also sometimes uh, we come across issues like uh, uh, maybe one data set, uh, it's using British units and the other one is using metric units. Uh, I don't know if you go to the US, uh, they're still using pounds and gallons and uh, uh, not the uh, miles, not the kilometers and the liters, right? So if you get two data sources, one from the US, one from Sri Lanka, we are using the metric system, we might be in trouble if you don't uh, properly integrate, right? So you need to be aware of what you're integrating and making sure that you integrate it properly, right? Um, yeah, and also when you integrate data, one of the biggest issues that we come across is that uh, uh, same data 
might be coming uh, from different places, right? So age might be coming from one source and another source or age or date of birth, right? So in that case, we need to make sure that uh, we remove the redundancy, right? So redundant data uh, is is a problem, right? I mean, I mean, not a problem. I mean, it's uh, it's a waste of our storage. Sometimes uh, machine learning models might uh, not work because we have too much of data, right? So how do you remove redundant uh, 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 redundant data? So one way of uh, removing redundant data is to do uh, what you call this correlation, right? So when it comes to, I mean, this is a bit of statistics here, right? So we know that data science requires a bit of statistics, uh, not not a bit, uh, quite a lot of statistics, right? So we can do a correlation analysis to check and see. I mean, if you don't know, I mean, if you know that these two attributes are the same, we can remove one of them. But if you have a situation where the attribute names are slightly different and we are not 100% sure, whether we can remove one of the attributes or not, because you don't want to just drop attributes for the sake of uh, dropping attributes. Right? So we can do some correlation. So uh, categorical attributes, we can use kite squared test, or uh, I mean, there's an example here, but I'm not going to go through the example due to the uh, time. Uh, I mean, we are bound by time, right? So uh, yeah, all this, we can try correlation uh, analysis uh, for numeric data, uh, Pearson correlation, or uh, uh, there are a few other uh, correlation uh, metrics uh, that we can use. Once again, uh, what we are trying to do here is we have multiple columns. We want to find out uh, uh, whether they are the same, right? So how do you find that they are the same? If the correlation, and in the case of Pearson correlation, if it is uh, one or one, that means it's perfectly correlated. In that case, most probably they are the same attribute. Right, so or else uh, we can uh, you, you look at that, or else we can maybe try to visually look at it. Right, so to guess because sometimes uh, what happens is uh, correlation computation is very expensive, but uh, sometimes we do that uh, to find out. Once we do the data integration, we do that to find out whether there are any uh, data attributes that are redundant. Right, so because uh, hanging on to these redundant data items might not be uh, useful for us. Right, that is about data integration. Then we can talk about uh, data reduction, right? So uh, why we need data reduction or what is data reduction? Uh, so data can be in different forms, maybe larger uh, data sets are there, but uh, when it comes to uh, analyzing, when it comes to mining, or when it comes to machine learning, sometimes you would like to uh, put, put it into a smaller format or reduce uh, format so that it's manageable maybe the machine learning model can work on it right so uh, right so it can be uh, horizontally and vertically right so uh, right so what i mean by uh, horizontally uh, sometimes it's the columns that we might want to reduce or sometimes it can be vertically uh, that we want to we have 10 million uh, records and we want to produce it to 5 million because our <laughs> gpu cannot handle it or something like that it's not advised if you can have all the data that's the best especially when it comes to the number of rows but number of columns if you can uh, there are other issues when it comes to number of columns right so yeah so what are the what are the uh, uh, strategies that we can uh, use right right so in other words what we're trying to do is uh, we have the data set with the data reduction strategies what we try to do is we try to uh, come up with a uh, reduced representation, right? Uh, the same data, but in a kind of a reduced form so that uh, we have the characteristics of the data uh, and we can do everything that we want or almost do everything that we want, uh, but we can still uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, we, we can do it with a smaller representation of the data set, right? So that's what we try to do with the uh, data reduction, right? So yeah, so when it comes to data reduction, we can talk about uh, dimensional reduction, right? Uh, Right, so dimensional reduction means uh, we have a larger number of dimensions, maybe 100 dimensions, but we want to bring it down to a smaller set of uh, our dimensions, or else uh, we, we can do what we call uh, numeracity reduction. Right, so in other words, um, uh, uh, I mean, the data might be having a very, very minute, uh, high granular values rather than. Uh, you rather than keeping the data as it is, we can try to reduce it into a uh, less uh, granular form, right? So that uh, uh, so that it's easier to handle and the size of the data is uh, smaller. Or is uh, we can uh, think about just compressing the data and 
maybe doing the mining on a compressed form of the, uh, the, the, the data that we have, right? Yeah, so first of all, let's look at the uh, dimension into reduction. Right? So we, are, we have this uh, thing called the curse of dimensionality. Right? So you know what a curse is. Curse is something that is actually, uh, when you say that you put a curse on something, right? So uh, from a data science point of view, one of the curses that we have is dimensionality. Because uh, uh, in general, you might think that more data you have, uh, you have a better way of uh, doing things. But especially when it comes to machine learning models, sometimes uh, when you have a large number of dimensions, these machine learning models uh, uh, fail, right? Simply because uh, the, the sparseness of the data increases when you have a lot of dimensions, right? So, uh, I mean, most of the machine learning uh, models actually use uh, distances, right? So when you have large, I mean, this, I mean, heavily, I mean, this is based on mathematical theories, right? So when, when we, when we have a larger dimensional space, uh, these distances become slightly meaningless, right? When, when we are in a smaller dimensional space, uh, these distances are, uh, uh, distances have more meaning, right? So if I try to explain it in simple terms. Right, so so what we need to do is we try to actually reduce this uh, uh, the number of dimensions, right? Right, so what can we do? Right, so with, with dimension reduction, we can actually avoid this curse of dimensionality, right? And also try to remove some of these uh, irrelevant features. Sometimes uh, some of the features may not be useful for us, right? Uh, or maybe reduce some of the noise, right? Uh, and also the, the the time that is required for training can be reduced or the space that is required for training uh, for running these machine learning algorithms can be reduced by reducing the dimensionality right or else uh, make it easy for us to visualize now you know uh, it's very easy to visualize uh, I mean, not very easy single dimension is easiest two dimensions quite okay three dimensions uh, slightly okay but when it goes beyond three dimensions we can't visualize right now we can visualize but it's it's hard to visualize and hard to understand what's going on. Right? So dimensional reduction helps us to actually uh, uh, visualize the data also, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so what are some of the uh, dimensional reduction techniques uh, that are there, right? So uh, I'm saying wavelet transformation, but uh, uh, Fourier transformation type approaches are there, then PCA approaches are there, and then we can also, uh, we can also go for this some kind of supervised or non-linear techniques uh, uh, that are out there. Right, so this this slide is actually uh, once again not from the textbook, from somewhere else. I should have put the uh, source for this uh, slide. Uh, right. So what what do you see here? Right. So in the three dimensions, you see that the uh, there are thousand positions of the data points that we have. Right. So let's say this is the data set that is given. Right. So if you if you reduce this. Uh, uh, three-dimensional data set into a two-dimensional data set, what happens? We can see some patterns, right? So we can see some grouping, right? So we can see some grouping uh, that is forming, right? Uh, and actually we can reduce the positions into 100 positions, right? Uh, when you reduce it to two, two dimensions, right? And what about uh, reducing it further? Go to one dimension. Now we, we can very, very clearly see uh, very, very clearly see some uh, separations and also the number of positions that we have is uh, a 10 position. I'm not saying that uh, 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 we should, I mean, when, when we reduce the dimensions, uh, we should do it in a, I mean, this is a very, very crude uh, way of uh, reducing the dimensions, just projecting it onto the 2D plane and then projecting it to the 1D plane. Uh, 1D plane. Yeah, I do have a, a question. What is data normalization? Definitely, I will... Uh, we have a slide at, uh, at the end uh, where we talk about data transformation and normalization is part of that, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it when, when we get there. Right? So here, what you should look at is uh, what happens uh, when we reduce the dimensions, right? So once again, I'm not going to go into details because uh, uh, I mean, uh, talking about Fourier transformations and wavelet transformation uh, is uh, completely in uh, two other courses, right? But uh, just get the idea, right? So uh, the data as it is, I mean, comes in, I mean, if we are collecting some uh, data in waveforms, uh, it's in the, the time domain, right? Uh, and we will have uh, multiple waves and then including the noise, everything would be there. So what we can do with, with this transformation, Fourier transformations or wavelet transformations is to try to convert it into a, a, a 
to the frequency domain where we are uh, uh, the, 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 we actually what we are doing is some form of dimension reduction right so that we can actually put it into a form that is easily analyzable right rather than trying to analyze it uh, uh, as it is uh, uh, captured right so that's uh, what we try to do principal component analysis once again what we are trying to do is uh, uh, when the data is in multiple i mean its own original uh, uh, space what we would uh, what we would do is so what we would uh, uh, try to do is uh, we try to project it into a uh, a best possible uh, plane uh, so that uh, plane plane or hyperplane uh, so that uh, we can actually uh, get a get a better uh, get a better distribution of the data points right so once again i will i will leave it there but remember pca can be used for dimensionality reduction right and another thing is uh, attribute subset selection right so what we mean by attribute subset selection both those uh, things are techniques uh, that we can use and reduce it here what we are doing is we are trying to uh, if we have 100 uh, 100 attributes what we try to do is we try to pick and choose what is the good uh, good set of attributes out of the 100 attributes that we have right so some some of them are redundant some of them are irrelevant right so how do we do that right? so there are multiple ways of doing it one would be what we call uh, uh, i mean multiple combination right if there if there are 100 uh, dimensions right so uh, 2 into the power 100 would be the possibilities right you can't try all those right and right? so so what we, what can we do right so there are techniques like uh, step wise uh, feature selection right so uh, or step wise attribute elimination right so step wise feature selection means uh, you start with one or two attributes you add one attribute and check and see how good it is if it is good you keep it otherwise you throw it and take another one uh, the other way is you start with all the 100 and drop one by one right drop one by one uh, it's a search algorithm right search technique right so drop and see what is when you drop if you have a drastic difference you keep it and then try to drop something else right so once again you if you read uh, if you look uh, google search you should be able to find how these things are done and also uh, most of the tools most, most of the libraries would have this uh, available for you right so you can just uh, uh, do it right but you need to know what's happening right uh, yeah and also another thing that we could do is we can combine some of the attributes together and make uh, make a new attribute right that is called attribute creation or feature generation right so sometimes we use uh, domain expertise to do that right so sometimes we do other things uh, to uh, create attributes right so very very briefly um, uh, the second uh, data reduction is uh, what you call numeric reduction right so there are parametric uh, methods and non parametric methods right so parametric methods uh, would be to use uh, linear regression or some other form of uh, uh, regression approaches uh, to actually represent the data in uh, using um, some representation some regression line or regression curve and then maybe use that that we mean by uh, uh, numerosity reduction rather than having the individual data points now what we try to do is we try to represent it uh, uh, using the uh, uh, the regression uh, line or the regression curve that we have right so once again uh, i i leave this uh, slides here so that if you rewind this video if it is available you can have a look at it right so that's one thing and then uh, we can also do things like putting the data into histograms right histograms in the sense of binning or putting the data into uh, different uh, histograms right when you put it into histograms uh, what we could do is, so the idea is rather than having the individual values we put a collection of values together into one bin right so one uh, uh, bin right so that what we clustering is also another way of uh, 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 what we call numerosity reduction right rather than having all the values what we do is we do some clustering group them together and then maybe use one representative right rather than uh, having all the all the values right so one thing that we could do is uh, we could use that we have something called cluster centroid that right? we can use one representative maybe the mean in that cluster or the median in that cluster can be used as a as a representative of this entire group rather than keeping the entire uh, keeping all those data points right so that's another way of uh, reducing sampling is also another way of doing it which is not i mean statistical uh, from a statistics point of view statisticians use sampling a lot but when it comes to data science data mining sometimes we we try to avoid it, but if we don't have any other choice maybe we can use sampling right so when you do sampling we can uh, do a random sampling or uh, uh, 
in sampling that's not very good uh, also sampling variations are there like we can do the sampling uh, without uh, replacement with replacement right also we can use stratified sampling right so this slide actually shows you what we mean by um, uh, with replacement and without replacement right so i think you guys know what what we mean by that uh, stratified sampling means uh, uh, rather than just randomly sampling, uh, we, we if there is a, a certain distribution in the class for a certain uh, group, what we do is we when we do the sampling, we try to make sure that that distribution is maintained in the um, sample also, so that we get a better better representation of the uh, training data that we have. Right? Uh, data cube aggregation. Once again, you need to know what a data cube is. Uh, data cube is a way of uh, representing the data. data in data warehouses we use data cubes right so what we mean by data cube aggregation is that uh, rather than uh, it's like a, it's considered it as an excel sheet right excel sheet, sheet is a two-dimensional uh, sheet right the data cube is a multi-dimensional excel sheet i would call it right so each cell has a value right so rather than uh, using those values individual values what we do is we aggregate them right so we uh, we aggregate them uh, in this example, I think yeah, I have this example. We have branch A, B, C, D, right? So we would might we might be having individual values for branch A, B, C, D. But in our requirement, if you don't need uh, A, B, C, D to be uh, separated, why not aggregate them together and put put it together, right? So that's what we call cube aggregation. Once again, we can reduce the size of the data, right? So data compression is also another thing that we do encoding, right? So uh, string data text data then when we have sometimes we can encode it or we can try to uh, reduce it there's a lot of theory behind that uh, audio video if you have we can try to reduce or compress it uh, time sequence data we can try to reduce it and when you talk about compression we talk about uh, you know, sometimes the compression might be what you call a lossy compression sometimes it might be lossless right so we try to keep it lossless because uh, we would like uh, if possible to get the original data but even if it is lossy, uh, sometimes we can work. Um, yeah, so we get to the last uh, topic. I do have a few questions. Keep sending those questions. I'll take each one of them as soon as I uh, finish finish this last section. We have I've taken a few minutes. I think we, we started 10 minutes uh, late or 50, about 12 minutes, uh, right? So I will take a few more minutes to uh, talk about the, the data transformation. Once again, a very, very important thing because there's one question also on that. Right. Uh, what we do with the data transformation is to try to transform the data into a form uh, that we can use. Right. So once again, we, we talk about the same things that we talked about earlier, smoothing. Right. Smoothing is something that we talk about. Right. Uh, or attribute construction. Right. Uh, aggregations. Right. We talked about it earlier. And normalization is the key point here. Right. So sometimes uh, when we have data in different uh, value ranges right so for example if we have age and salaries but right, you want to focus the salary value so maybe do something on salaries right so age is coming from maybe 20 to 50 and the salaries are going from 100,000 to 500,000 right so certain algorithms will not have problems but certain algorithms might have problems when you have these two different ranges so what you should do is you should normalize it right so there are normalizing the sense to bring both those values to the to a same i mean even if you if you try to plot these uh, right so you you see the problem right so therefore we need to try to bring this uh, this value uh, to a, a, a similar range right so what we could do is we could do different types of normalizations right so min max normalization yeah so min max uh, normalization is something that we could do it's a very very simple uh, normalization where we uh, bring the values to between zero and one or minus one and plus one no problem uh, what we are doing is mapping uh, the the range of the values to the to the range that we want right so the formula is given here very very simple straightforward and once again the tools and the, the libraries will have this a zip score normalization i think all of you should be familiar with people who have gone to sri lankan universities right so uh, that's another type of normalization Normalization by decimal scaling. Multiple approaches are there. I'm just showing you a few examples. Uh, discretization, once again, is a, is another transformation that we do, right? So uh, uh, you might be thinking that similar things have been discussed, right? Yeah, that's true. But we, we talk about it as part of transformation, right? Transforming the data. 
right? So discretization, right? So the numeric values that we have, we would put it into discretized classes, right? The discretized intervals, right? So how do we do that? Once again, we, our friend Binning comes into help histogram analysis or putting them into different uh, uh, categories or clustering can be uh, uh, done. Right? So why, why is that important, right? So uh, can we just, I mean, I have a, I have a slide. Uh, uh, yeah, so being uh, example is given here, right? So uh, yeah, this uh, this slide shows you, right? So uh, original data is given uh, in, in the top left hand, left hand corner, right? Uh, with uh, some classes, right? So if we just do a equal with uh, binning, uh, see how it is going to be broken. Uh, it's going actually in the middle of some classes, uh, some uh, uh, maybe some clusters that are there, right? So right, so equal with. Uh, might not work, right? What about equal frequency? Even if you try to do equal frequency, see how it is be being broken, right? So we don't have time. Let me uh, use this, right? So see, the, this is the these are the boundaries that are coming when we go equal with. And if you go equal uh, frequency, what we mean by equal frequency is each uh, each category class would have or each uh, uh, bin would have uh, in uh, same number of items. Once again, it's not a good way of doing. It. What about doing clustering, right? If you do the clustering of this attribute, we might we will get some nice, uh, right? This is how we would want it. If there's some natural uh, natural separation in the original data set. We would like to get that natural separation into these uh, different bins that we, because we are trying to reduce the uh, numerosity of the data and put it into categories, but we don't want to do it like this. Uh, the previous two cases where we are breaking it in the wrong place, right? If you break it in the wrong place, pattern identification, whatever model building that we do can get into trouble, right? So that's why we, uh, that's why we try to do that. Uh, right, so another <laughs> thing on, uh, on uh, data transformation is, uh, if we have the data, we would want to create what we call these concept hierarchies. You already know what concept hierarchies are. Right, so for example, if you take date, it's a, it has a concept hierarchy. You start with the year, then we have the months, uh, then we have the weeks, uh, within the week, we have the day, uh, hour, minute, second. So there's a kind of a hierarchy. Can we call it the concept hierarchy. If you take an address, you have a concept hierarchy. You have the country, you have the province, you have the district, you have the city, street. Right, country is at the top level, and then you uh, have uh, lower levels, right? So, uh, Right, so when we have data, sometimes we can actually, uh, uh, I mean, if the if the concept hierarchy of the data is already given, no problem, we can use it. But uh, when you are using it in a model, when you are, you are trying to do analytics, we would like to see at what level we should be using. Should we go at the city level or should we go at the street level or should we do it at the, uh, uh, what they call the district level, right? So that's something that we should be aware of, right? So, uh, right, so first of all, as part of data preprocessing, we should try to figure out these concept hierarchies that are there in the data set. If the domain information is given to us, uh, we can figure that out and use it. If the domain information not, is not given, also we can do. So here, actually, this is my uh, one before the last slide. Right. So if the if the domain information is not given, uh, this is a way of uh, figuring out. Uh, I mean, let's say we are given country, province, city, uh, street data, but we don't know what this. Uh, what the relationship of these uh, uh, things are. I mean, when you know, when you see the country, province, city, street, we know, but let's assume that we don't know, right? We have come from Mars, right? And we don't know what the relation, what the concept hierarchy is. Well, but when you look at the data, what we can do is we can try to identify the distinct values, right? So uh, the, the, the one that comes at the top of the hierarchy should be having the smallest number of distinct values. And the one that comes at the bottom, lowest level should have the most number of distinct values, right? So by using some techniques like that, we can try to find this uh, concept hierarchies. I'm pretty sure the data set that you are going to get uh, would already be, uh, the concept hierarchies would be already identified, but uh, in case, or uh, if you do a future project, uh, in case uh, this is a way up, there are so many other ways of doing it. I'm just showing you a few ways of doing it. Right, uh, finally, before I summarize, uh, a small thing about, uh, uh, I mean, Part of data preprocessing is also uh, finding data, a descriptive characteristic, what we call descriptive analysis uh, should be done on the data, right? So that we understand the data. So after doing some data cleaning or data preprocessing, you should uh, try to 
uh, build some descriptive, uh, do some descriptive analytics, right? So looking at the median, maximum, minimum, or quantile values, outliers, right? Um, right. So or as try to identify the numerical dimensions, right? So uh, what is the data dispersion, right? What are the distributions that are there, right? Those are things that uh, we should look at as part of uh, data proposing to understand the data, right? Yeah, so if I very, very briefly summarize, we talked about the importance of data preprocessing, and we talked about uh, data quality, different aspects of data quality, and we talked about each and every uh, individual uh, aspects of data games. There's a, hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, I just got into a power cut uh, and lost one of my screens. Uh, yeah, okay, so I think I covered everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So let me take the questions uh, while we have it here. Uh, fortunately, because yeah, okay, okay, I can move. Right. Yeah. Let me take the questions. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, before that, maybe maybe uh, just talk to you about. Uh, I talk to you about. Um, you know, connecting what I've been talking uh, with the example that I gave you. So the, in the case of the dengue uh, prediction, the example that I gave you earlier, we had multiple data sets, right? CDR data, population data, meteorological data, satellite uh, images, and the dengue case data, right? So as part of data pre-processing, what do we have? Uh, yeah, uh, as part of data, oops, oops, oops. As part of data preprocessing, what we need to do is to combine this data together, right? So one big challenge we have is uh, if the data is coming from different, uh, uh, like for example, uh, maybe the uh, satellite data is coming at a different granularity to the uh, dengue case data, right? In that case, we need to make sure that we integrate the data properly and we have to do a lot of data cleaning. Right, so I will, I will, uh, I will leave it there and uh, go for the questions. Right, so I do have uh, questions on the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think I answered the question about normalization, right? Uh, so what is uh, what is data normalization? Uh, if I repeat uh, what is data normalization, data normalization is bringing the data into a form uh, uh, so that uh, normal, normalizing, right? So actually, uh, Z-score is a good example why A-level marks are put into Z-scores, right? So make sure that uh, we have a level playing field for people who do the A-levels from different areas, right? So something similar that is happening when it comes to data science uh, applications also. Machine, some of the, it's not always, it's some mach uh, machine learning models have issues uh, when it comes to having multiple, uh, multiple, uh, uh, data in multiple ranges, right? So we want to bring it, bring the, bring it into a, a kind of a range uh, that is agreeable across uh, all the attributes, right? So that's the reason why would we why we would be doing data normalization. Um, yeah. So uh, what are available methods for identifying outliers quickly? So uh, the, uh, yeah. So if it is a case, I didn't I didn't show that slide, but if it is a case of uh, a single attribute, right? Uh, single attribute, you want to find this outliers or noise, right? Um, one thing that we could do is if we can just quickly find out whether this is a normally, in most cases, the data is normally distributed, right? So if uh, some of the values are beyond mean plus three standard deviations, uh, we can uh, we can maybe clearly say that this is outlier or this is something wrong with this data. Actually, uh, yeah, right, so that's one way of doing it. In, if it is uh, uh, single dimensions, we can do that, but in cases, uh, multi-dimensional scenarios, what we could do is we could use some clustering techniques to actually identify outliers because uh, uh, there are se separate uh, 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 outlier detection algorithms out there that you can try to use. But in your case, in my opinion, uh, if you just look at the distribution and try to see whether these values are in a single att uh, attribute, if the values are going outside uh, uh, means plus three standard deviations, uh, obviously, because we know that uh, uh, in general, almost 99.99% 99 of the data should fit into this, right? Right. In that case, we can do that. Uh,
Um, yeah, so good question. Uh, do we need to consider the data set size in order to get proper conclusions? Um, yes, uh, because um, there is always, uh, when you say conclusions, I would say confident conclusions, right? So we would also always uh, want to make conclusions uh, with, with confidence, right? So what do we mean by confidence is that uh, we make a conclusion and then we try to apply it. For example, in my case, uh, the dengue case, if I take that, if I say that uh, in two weeks time, Murtu is going to have a, a quick, quite a big outbreak. I mean, we, we, if we take intervention, we stop it. But if you don't take the interventions in two weeks time, that should happen, right? Or at least 90% of the time that should happen, right? So obviously, uh, data set size has a, uh, uh, correlation with the confidence level, right? So some of the machine learning algorithms actually can indicate what is the level of confidence, right? So, right. So, and in statistical approaches also, we know that uh, uh, for some, I mean, uh, there is a bearing in uh, with respect to the confidence uh, with the size of the data. Right? So therefore, I mean, we can't do something with two or three data points, right? So we might, we need a significant amount of data. Certain machine learning algorithms require more. I mean, for example, deep learning would require much more data, uh, uh, much more data points than a single one or two or a hundred or two hundred data points, right? So in those cases, definitely uh, the data site data set size matters, right? But uh, now you, um, I don't know where, from where your question is coming. That you might be thinking, my, I, I was talking about data reduction, right? So by reducing the data, are we uh, losing the confidence? No, 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 because we are reducing the data by keeping the characteristics of the data set, right? Keeping, I mean, we are reducing the data set and coming with a represent, proper representation of the data set, right? So therefore, uh, uh, we can make the same conclusions or almost the same conclusions that we could have made with the original data set without uh, the compression. <laughs> yeah, so another question is about uh, noise removal, right? So it's very important. I think I mentioned it uh, when we talked about noise removal uh because um, uh, if our objective is not outlier detection or identifying noise then there is no effect uh, but if our objective is to look for outliers if you remove noise our outliers also might go with the noise right so i'll give you an example credit card fraud detect detection is one of the key areas in data science data mining business intelligence right so what we want to find out is uh, these guys who uh, use our cards, uh, steal our cards and use it in uh, from Russia or some other, I don't know if it's Russia, but other Eastern European countries. Uh, uh, I mean, those uh, those would be kind of unusual transactions that are taking place in a normal scenario, right? So if you try to remove uh, noise, if, you, if, you, if that, that might also fall as noise because it's unusual things, right? Right. In that case, definitely removing noise would be a problem, right? It will affect the conclusion. But if our conclusion is, it, it all depends on the objective, right? What are we trying to do, right? In that sense, uh, uh, we should be able to uh, make conclusion uh, without the noise. And removing the noise is important because some of the machine learning algorithms can get affected by the noise. Right? So we don't want that happening, right? We don't want that uh, mm -hmm. affecting our conclusions, right? Uh, those are all the questions I have here, right? So if you do have any other questions, uh, if you can ask, uh, and we can, others, we can conclude the session. I've taken a few more minutes than uh, what I anticipated. Yes, uh, Dr. Shahan, uh, if I may take Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, if there are, uh, maybe we can keep the Q&A open for maybe yeah yeah we can we can keep it minutes. Two, two minutes. Uh, there was another question, but that was regarding data storm. I'll, I'll give a small clarification on that. Someone had asked, uh, giving the team name for the competition. Um, it's that uh, it's a team a competition, so you have to have at least three members, uh, and you have to give a team name when you're registering. So that's a little clarification on that. Also, I would like to remind everyone that we will be taking a group picture. Uh, at the end of the session. So there is the virtual background shared in the chat box. Uh, please have it downloaded and uploaded so that once you turn on the camera, so you will have the virtual background. And again, if you do have any more questions for Dr. Shekhan, um, the chat box, uh, the Q&A will be open for maybe a, a few more minutes. And after that, we will be wrapping up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I would like to encourage all of you to uh, get 
into data storm and also if, uh, you can find other people uh, uh, who are idling not doing nothing or right get them into get them involved in this uh, because it's very exciting and a very useful uh, uh, event in my opinion uh, right so make sure that you take the maximum out of this uh, scenario the, the effort that is put in put in by uh, the road track club and the other resource people uh, you can maximize it by uh, making use of it right Right. There's a lot of potential for data science going forward. <clears throat> yeah, so guys, uh, you can either send it via chat or you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, if you do have any questions, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can ah, ask okay. questions yourself. Yeah. Maybe we can give a couple more minutes and after that we will be holding the Q&A session. Thank you. 